a few minutes with Dr. Jim Henderson. He is the University of Louisiana System President. Hey, Dr. Jim, welcome back to Keel. Hey, good morning. How are you? So, John Bell, the governor, has he's got a budget on his desk. Everything's going to be okay now, right? <laughs> well, you know, it's a uh, it's quite a budget he's got on his desk. It it it, it defaults on the top's promise uh, by opening uh, students uh, at seventy percent of what they've already earned and been promised by the state. And of course, it makes uh, uh, yet another uh, uh, large cut to to higher education to our colleges and universities. So if you like that budget and you think that's the way to prepare for the future, then, then we ought to live with it. But well, I don't think anybody me, agrees with that. Let me start here. You had to have, I would assume, you and and other people around you have seen something like this coming, or is this a surprise? No, it's not, to me it's not a surprise at all. I uh, uh, And just, you know, you, you knew that they were going to have a hard time uh, developing a budget under the existing constraints. When And those constraints are revenue constraints. Those constraints are structural constraints. And I think everyone knew they were going to have a hard time. The, the question was, where were the cuts going to fall during this round of budgeting? And so I'm, I'm not surprised, and I, and I want to be clear, I'm optimistic that they're going to solve the problem in, in, the, in the special session. I, I believe that, that the vast majority of legislators I've spoken to know that, that talent development is key for our future competitiveness. They know that, uh, that the top's promise is something that, but whether you think it's a policy decision, we should fulfill it, or if you think it's a moral decision, you should fulfill it. Either way, I think there's a consensus that it should be fulfilled. And they understand that our colleges and universities already operate at the lowest resource base per student in the nation. And they know that they can't continue to, to disinvest in talent development if we're going to be successful in the future. You are not a man without uh, influence, and you are not a man without a telephone. So what do you hear that the governor's going to do with 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 this budget? Veto, well, sign it, line item stuff. What do you what what do you what do you hear? Well, I, I don't hear a lot about that. I know he's got uh, 20 days to to uh, evaluate and sign the budget. Uh, I know that next Tuesday, I just got a notice uh, late yesterday afternoon that he is going to uh, uh, have a conversation with a large population from the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Uh, at one o'clock in the afternoon, I know several elected officials will be there. Uh, there'll be some announcements, I think, on his decisions and some other things that are coming. For, I think we'll have a, some clarity uh, next Tuesday on what he proposes as a solution. Doctor Jim, pardon me, but but l- let's go to civics class here for a second. The special session is ready to begin. That's like a total of I think fourteen days, ten working days. He's got twenty days to sign or reject or fix the budget. How do those? How do those sort of meld? How, how they drive, yeah. Yeah, going at the same yeah. time. So, so what you're budget right now is, is a baseline. This is what the, uh, the legislature says. This, these are our priorities with the resources we have. And so in a special session, if they, if they decide to renew a part of the expiring tax, remember the tax is going down July 1st, and uh, most of the proposals I've seen only restore a portion of it. So we're all going to get a tax break July 1st. And so they have a, a, an ability to, to, to make a revenue adjustment. They can do some things with some credits. They can clean some pennies. They can do a number of things that are in the, in the call. And they also have the ability to make supplemental appropriations. And so whatever revenue changes they make, whatever they can make a supplemental appropriation, I dare say they could reduce an appropriation or, or they needed to do that. I'm not, I'm not sure about that. But they have the ability to both uh, appropriate money and to uh, make changes to revenue in the special session. Let me ask you this. The higher ed cuts, we always hear higher ed cuts, higher. What's cutting? What's getting the what's getting the slash? What are we going to see happen at our colleges and universities if this budget is implemented? Well, two things. One, you're going to see, uh, remember, we've seen the largest disinvestment in state support of higher education in the nation. I had a, a legislator who was referring back to 2004. And saying that should be the baseline that everybody looks at, and we should use CPI as a as an indicator. But when you look at total state support for higher education since 2004, using CPI, we've already been cut 350 million dollars uh, since 2004. And our competitors in other states have been increasing their investment in higher education, both in student support and in instruction, and faculty salaries, and investments in technology and infrastructure. And you're going to see all of those issues that we fall behind on get exacerbated. Am I saying the sky is falling? No. I am saying that, that we're at a point where a cut of that magnitude is going to have significant negative repercussions on their colleges and universities and the employers that employ our graduates. 
But the other part of that is you have students that are going to school on a promise made to them by the state of Louisiana. And we're telling them that, you know what, we're only going to fulfill 70% of the promise, even though you've upheld 100% of your end of the bargain. That, to me, is unconscionable, and we've got to remove If we want to if we think TOPS is unsustainable, then change it legislatively, change it in the program itself, but don't just say we're refusing to honor our commitment to students. That's just, to me, is un- unacceptable. Let's hone in on LSU Shreveport, Southern Shreveport, Bipsy. Are we going to see professors leave? Are we going to see enrollment numbers down now? I mean, nuts and bolts, is that going to happen? I, I think it very well could. You're going to look at the 17, about a 17% cut to the state appropriation to each of those institutions. You're going to see uh, the students, and, and you, you name some of those, name Bipsy, name LSU Shreveport, name Southern Shreveport, where they have a lot of, of, of rural students, commuter students that come into those schools that uh, – Finding an extra $1,500 that was unexpected to pay for school is very, very difficult. It's probably undoable for several of them. They're barely making ends meet as it is. Uh, so, yeah, you're going to see an enrollment drop from some of those schools, and it's going to hit those students that we can least afford to have drop out of the system. Those are the students that we need to develop their skills and talents so that they can compete in the 21st century economy. So yeah, it's going to have a very negative impact on all of our schools. And, listen, this is on the heels Across the UL system, we graduated more than 8,500 students this spring. Tech had its largest graduation. I'll speak at it tomorrow. Its largest graduation in the school's history. ULM, largest graduation in the school's history. And you go across the state, all of our schools, even in this, uh, uh, with a lack of resources, are producing at a higher level than ever before, at the lowest cost than ever before. Now is not the time to step backwards and continue this disinvestment. Dr. Jim, on Tuesday, I think it was, we had this big health care confab um, um, town hall meeting here in Shreveport at the old Shumpert place. And Erin was there, and she told the story about at one point, and I think it was either Dr. Golly or Jay Darden talking, and a fellow stood up and said, my wife works here, and we go through this every year where we don't know if we have the money. My wife who works here doesn't know if she's going to have a job and this is just so tiring and exhausting, and we're over it, and you need to do something. You've had some very interesting comments about a potential constitutional convention on Facebook, social media, etc. Going through this every year, I'm sure you know how this fellow at, at University Health, I'm, I'm sure you know how he feels. Are you tired of, are you as tired of it as is he? No, I don't. I don't really get tired. I'm, I'm, I'm. I do get frustrated sometimes with the process. I get frustrated with the misinformation uh, that comes uh, throughout the process. Like for instance, somebody yesterday was talking about higher education having this off-budget source of resources of about three billion dollars, which was is just a ridiculous statement. It's just fundamentally not true. Uh, there's lots of misinformation that's out there. Uh, I hate that part of it. The Constitutional Convention. You know, it's a mechanism to try to solve a problem that we've been unable to solve legislatively. Uh, It might be the right approach. Uh, I will tell you that that everything that you can do in a constitutional convention, a lot of those things you could do legislatively if you're willing to engage in the conversation. And conversations are very difficult to have because it requires people to be informed. It requires people to be honest and candid with each other. And in today's political environment, it's hard for any of those things to take place. I, I understand this person's angst, and when you're dealing every single year, especially in higher ed, especially in, 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 in the higher ed uh, nexus of with health care, it does get frustrating. It does get tiring, and there's some simple solutions. You know, we, three years ago when they passed the temporary sales tax, it was temporary because they were going to spend time to develop a comprehensive review of taxation, of what is the appropriate revenue level to tax taxation policy in Louisiana, and they made zero progress on that. And so – you got to wonder, is that part of the process broken, or are there other things that, that will that will derail even a constitutional convention? These other political concerns that are about power, that are about party. Uh, you know, it's very, it gets very complicated. I don't think it's an easy solution. Our last 30 seconds. What do you think the governor's going to do? Give me your crystal ball. I think the governor is going to try to work with the legislature over the next uh, 15 days, 16 days, to find a solution that funds our priority. And... Uh, and he'll let this budget sit there a minute? I, that's what I would do. I'd let it sit there, and let's let's try to work together in good faith. Um, even though it's been hard, I think we have to try. Let's work in good faith to solve the problem, 
fund our priorities, fulfill the top's promise, and maintain our investment in colleges and universities because it's the strongest return on investment we have in the state budget. So you say don't sign it right now? I wouldn't. Jim Henderson? Not, not this one. Thank you so much for your time. We <laughs> appreciate it. <laughs> hey, thank you all very uh-huh. much.